you, you account too. Um, we want to say um, that you are important to our liberation um, and we no longer are going to put up with being excluded. Um, so I see that kind of interchallenging that can happen on the inside as, 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 as well. Um, so it's not just, you know, as much as we say, um, as much as I'm arguing that this kind of kind of rage is directed towards racist racism, um, you know, we know that within black, the black community, there's a lot of hatred um, against queer folk um, and the anger that those queer folk can offer up to other black folk can be the kind of virtuous anger that I'm referring to. And it's, it's trying to or attempting to do the kind of work uh, that the features of this rage is also doing when we're thinking about a white on black kind of rage as well. Yeah, because I'm thinking of um, other moments when the discourse of Black rage surfaced publicly, saliently in a powerful way. The, the Prince Cobb, uh, William Greer book of 1968, Black Rage, that mm -hmm. thing just took over, I remember, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. and it, it, uh, it, it, did, it, it was powerful. It was very important. It got that very negative review of Kenneth Clark in the New York view of books, but uh, it, 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 it was riding the weight. Brother Martin had just been assassinated mm -hmm. in Chicago, the various rebellions of 60, over 200 of them. Now here we are 2021 after Brother Floyd, after Sister Bland and the others have been murdered by police, that your text arrives at a very mm -hmm. crucial historical moment. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a, a much more, not just subtle and sensitive, but also much more uh, piercing text in terms of its morality and spirituality, because mm -hmm. Black rage could be just, it could be so broad sweeping mm -hmm. that it spills over in ways that have to be, you know, called into question. So it could devour your own soul, it could mm -hmm. dehumanize others. But how do you view your text in light of this historical mm -hmm. moment the same way that the Greer Cobb book right. uh, in 68? Right, right. So I, I wanna say that I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, sure. And sure. I kind of express in the introduction that as much as it's easy to think that the book is, a black rage, uh, is about black rage, it is a book about rage directed right. at racism, racist, racist attitudes, racist right. people, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Right. Um, so it, it encompasses, that's a big umbrella, right? So it can encompass what we call black rage, but it can also, it also encompasses the rage of, of our Asian American brothers and sisters who've been the target of, of hatred, right? Mm -hmm. It's also um, about the rage of our Arab brothers and sisters who've been, um, who've been the recipients of racism. Um, it's also about the rage of white folk who are tired of living in a racist world and wants to see a transformation um, a transformation. So, you know, I would say that what makes what makes it different for me is that I'm not just trying to express the anger of black folk. Right. I'm trying to express the anger of white folk <laughs> and also other people of color who, who are angry about 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 racism. Um, it's interesting because I started, you know, I started thinking about this uh, this topic um, in 2012 um, at the tragic murder of, of Trayvon Martin. And I think one of the things that motivated me to write the text, or at least it was a writing sample for graduate school before it became this book. Um, <laughs> I did look, it's a writing a sample that didn't get me into any programs that year. Let me just, you know, you know, so, so Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which meant, oh. which meant it was courageous. It was <laughs> right. courageous. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, but it was, it was, at that moment, I was trying to make sense in 2012 of the anger that a lot of, of, of I, that I was feeling um, that a lot of black folk was feeling. Um, but I was also uh, not only trying to make sense of that and trying to figure out what is it doing, uh, um, but I was also very much concerned about why it was so, um, how may I say this? Why was the rage of, of people at racism so intimidating uh, to witnesses? Um, and I'm thinking about interviews that were taking place in which um, people were saying, you know, why are you angry? It, it was a question mark or um, questions of civility of that, you, you know, yeah, I understand you're angry, but can you speak differently than what you're doing? And, and, and I was seeing that criticism, right? People very fearful of the anger of, the, anger of these protesters. People making judgments about the anger of these protesters. People even inciting Martin Luther King <laughs> as reasons for why these black folk and their allies shouldn't be angry. So, so at the same time, I'm witnessing, trying to make sense of what I was feeling 
what I saw, comrades' feelings, but also listening to this criticism that wasn't just taking place in books that was written in, in ancient Rome, right? But it was coming out of the mouths of pundits, that was coming out of the mouths of, of, of even my students. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of not just Black rage, but the rage that people were feeling at, at racism that was, uh, became um, public, that was becoming centralized in the media and in the news. I'm trying to make sense of, of, of that and also have a response for those that were criticizing. One of the things that I, 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 I say um, as I've been talking to folk is that I take this to be kind of a love letter, the book being a love letter for the outrage. Um, it's for those who have felt um, anger and don't know how to make sense of it. People who have felt anger and have felt a sense of shame. I mean, grew up in a religious household, religious context. Um, you know, we were taught in some ways that, you know, you shouldn't feel angry, you should forgive. Um, but no one ever was loud about the scripture says, be angry and sin not. Um, so, you know, I, and even as a woman, I saw how it was gendered in the sense that yeah. even to express yeah. anger uh, was not considered feminine. So I, I wanted to write this to those who was trying to make sense of it, those who are feeling shame um, about it, but also those who wanted to figure out what they can do about it. Um, and also, as much as it's a love letter for the outrage in our context, in our time, I also felt that it was something that someone could hand, hand to a critic who would say, as we talked about at the beginning of this, hey, get rid of anger because it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to violence. This is, this is the book to silence the critic, or at least attempt to. Um, um, but also, more importantly for me, it's a, it's a love letter. Um, for those who are outraged in our, in our moment, but not just black folks who are outraged, um, uh, but other and all folks who are outraged of, of, of what our world looks like. I want folks to see what the book <laughs> looks like. My Easter cherry, the anger is essential to anti-racist struggle. Why anger is essential to anti the case for race, it is unapologetically black, <laughs> it is unequivocally universal. You see, it's, yes. it's, it's, like, it's like the best of our music. Mm -hmm. it, it comes from the chocolate side of town. It comes <laughs> from the Black joy, the Black sorrow, the Black right. struggle, the Black shuddering, the Black suffering. But it is, in fact, for everyone who's concerned about their humanity, who's concerned about their own fears and insecurities and anxiety, and therefore, it, it's it's it represents the best of you know tradition I come from. So I mean, mm -hmm. it speaks to me in a very powerful way. As did Audre Lorde. Mm -hmm. See, I, I'm old enough to you know, <laughs> spend time with Audre Lorde, been in the mm -hmm. same rooms with her, heard her give presentations and so forth, and to see your voice, your text, build on the great Audre Lorde with the philosophical sophistication that you have but you also remain rooted in the morality and spirituality. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to witness, my sister. It really Thank is. Thank you, Brother West. Thank you. Thank you. I'm interested. I want, I want to ask, ask you a question, throw a question at you. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So one of the things that I was, I, I was wondering when I knew when you said yes to having this conversation and we sent the book to you, um, I wonder how you read this, given your Christian framework. Um, I kind of alluded to the kind of virtues that are, are held up um, right. in That's Christianity. Right. Um, and for so many people, rage, what people call wrath is considered a vice. Um, so I just, I just wonder, I, I, I wonder how you read this, um, yeah. given your yeah. Christian framework. And did I change your mind on anything? <laughs> Or, or, or challenge your mind on anything, given given that that tradition or that that yeah. Well, no, I appreciate that question. I mean, you know, just a few weeks we're going to be back together with Brandon Terry and Brother Corey and Jonathan Walton and others talking about prophesied deliverance. Mm -hmm. My text mm -hmm. of forty years ago, revolutionary Christianity, and all of us be together with Anna Heath and the other. And uh, the overlap is so deep and profound because. My understanding of prophetic Judaism, see, Amos is really upset. I mean, you describe what Amos' state of mind, his orientation, the state of his soul and spirit actually is in terms of the virtuous conceptions of anger and rage. Right. And I would say the same thing about Isaiah and, and the same thing about Jesus in the temple. Mm -hmm. And the same thing about uh, uh, the item, you know, I had to be Wells teaching Sunday school 
every Sunday in Chicago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with that thing. So that I, I felt as if you were actually providing a, a philosophical case and a philosophical understanding of what my own Christian informed of rage is all about. So I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't detect any, uh, any deep disagreement, but I, I felt similar things with Audrey Lord too. It's just mm -hmm. that you tease out the philosophical dimensions that Audrey doesn't, but mm -hmm. it's still a Lordian mm -hmm. anger, a Lordian conception of rage there though. Very, mm -hmm. very so. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you think that I, I missed something? That's no, 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 no. I like, <laughs> I like, I like that response. It's, 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 it's good to know. It's good to know. It's good to know. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good. It's good to know. Absolutely. It's good to know. It's good to know. So I think we got some questions from the audience, and uh, uh, we're going to be led um, in those questions by Sister Tracy. Um, but I'm looking forward to. Uh, and, and perhaps, Brother Wes, you and I can answer these questions together. I think that'd be that'd be fun. Well, I'm on the train, but on the caboose. <laughs> on the train and in the caboose. Let me put it that way. I'm on your train, but in the caboose. So you you go first, and then we'll have oh, time. Oh, sure. Let's do it. We're so it. blessed to have Sister Tracy <laughs> here too. We're so blessed to have Sister Tracy here, and her wonderful work in New York and Temple, and now Riverside. Both of you all in Riverside. I told. For both of you all to be in Riverside is like Aretha Franklin and Gladys Knight being in the bluegrass. I'm Aretha. I'm Aretha. <laughs> oh, you grabbed Aretha already. You got Gladys. All right. I hear you. But we love Riverside. We love Riverside. Brother Alex and the other, my, uh, my daughter's a companion now, right from Riverside. So that uh, uh, I don't want to put the whole town down, but you know, it had been <laughs> on the cutting edge of soulfulness. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sterling Specky was a great giant in Riverside. So they Riverside is blessed to have both of you all at the same time, I think. Thank you. This is such a great conversation. So just thank you to both of you here today. Um, the first question in the chat is, in popular media, we often see the kind of violent revenge narratives highlighted that you spoke about at the start of your talk. Are there pieces of media or art that represent the kind of rage you write about? Mm, mm. I mean, one of the things that Brother West alluded to was some of the artful expressions um, and thinking about Black art um, and how it comes out of you know, deep emotions. And one of those emotions being, being anger at our, at our reality. Um, there was a mention of Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. um, as much as uh, Brother West wants to contrast that with what NWA was talking about, but I'm thinking about Lauryn Hill, I'm thinking about um, early mm -hmm. hip hop being an example. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, even if we go to jazz, I'm thinking about So What and a lot of Mingus tracks in this 1959 album, Express Anger at, at Social Injustice. Um, so there's been, I mean, not only do we see it in the figures that I was referring to, but also an artful expression. I mean, I mean, not to just isolate the African American you know, tradition as if it's the only tradition, but it's full of art that comes from pain, suffering, and, and anger. Um, and I think that that becomes an example. I mean, as much as we kind of, as the question alludes to that it has this anger necessarily as, as uh, conceptually involves this payback and this anger that, that Nussbaum and other philosophers suggest. I mean, when I think about black art, it tells a very different story. It tells a very, very, very different story. Um, so those are the artful or artistic examples that come to mind. I mean, as much as we talked about music, we can also talk about film. Um, I mean, it's hard for me and I don't know how you feel about this, Brother West, but mm -hmm. it's hard for me um, to experience any kind of art um, that just focuses on one kind of emotion, um, particularly in African American tradition. Um, I think sometimes you may have a tendency to look over the anger because it may not feel so good in that particular moment, whether it's that particular note or that, that particular tune um, or a particular scene. But I think there's a variety of emotions um, that, that, that is expressed, that can be expressed in one track or one song um, or, or one scene or one piece of art, um, but it's 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 there. The question is: are, Do we see it? Do we feel it? Do we want to feel it? Do we want to experience it? But it's most definitely most definitely there. I mean, I think that's so true. You see, because see, I believe that black love is a crime in white supremacist mm -hmm. regime, white supremacist empires, and there is a dimension of rage and anger in all forms of love, especially black love. 
So it's impossible to love folk and not be full of rage when they're treated unfairly. And it's mm -hmm. impossible to love black folk who've been taught to hate themselves and trying to get them to be liberated from that hatred inside and what's coming at them simultaneously without being full of a tremendous rage. That's why we love mm -hmm. Malcolm, that's why we love mm -hmm. Fannie Lou and the others, you see. And, and uh, uh, look at Harriet Tubman, man, she trying to, you know how much rage it took to go into the belly of the 19th <laughs> time right. with your gun right. and your Bible? Harriet. But that's what love is at its deepest level, especially black love. So that, the, uh, so that I think one of the reasons why black rage is something that is so fearful because it probably is the one phenomenon that has the capacity to bring down the curtain on America as right. a social experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that so that, and, and, out of sheer raw self-interest, people say, make sure that black folk not expressing the rage. They know mm -hmm. inside they could be devouring mm -hmm. themselves. They don't say nothing about that, but make mm -hmm. sure they're not expressing the rage. And when you get public figures, Make sure they're not angry. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. we don't want Barack angry. We don't want Michelle angry. We don't want the entertainers angry. It's, oh, wait, wait a minute now. The question is not the anger. The question is how deep the love is. Right, 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 right. I mean, I, if I can just piggyback on that, get on the caboose with you. Um, you know, one of the things <laughs> that I talk about in, in the book, as much as we think that anger is always directed at the wrong door, directed at the powers that be. One of the things I want people to understand is connects to your love point. Um, mm -hmm. and, and one of the, you know, kind of picking up on why people are afraid of, of, of the rage is not only that it can transform our world, but what it does um, is that it pronounces value on the marginalized. It says uh, that yeah. despite the social structure, despite what Hegemony says black lives are, what love, what, what anger does it, is it expresses or articulates uh, the value of certain kinds of lives. I mean, you live in a white supremacist society, uh, which the whole thing is the white supremacy, that whites are supreme above, et cetera, et cetera, to articulate, to declare that I'm angry. I mean, you know, one of the connections that I make in the book is that there's a connection between anger, value, and respect. Um, that when you, when you think that an object is valuable, um, then you will desire that they are respected. And when they are disrespected, you will respond to that disrespect with, with anger. And I think also what is problematic or what is, what is um, um, fearful for those who are in, in, in positions of domination, not only do they wanna keep the structure in place, but they also uh, want to transform the psychology of the oppressed to think that they're not worthy, to think that they're not valuable, to think that they are inferior. And what, what, what anger declares is that that is indeed not the case. So it transgresses against those values. It transgresses yes. against those norms as it challenges the social structure. And one just quick, quick point, you think the flip side, when black people are expected to be angry and they're not right. as angry yeah. as people expect. It's like when Malcolm X responses to the, responds to the assassination of JFK. People expect him to be full of anger. Right. He mm -hmm. said, well, you know, so he, yeah, he died, but <laughs> Roosevelt got killed. Jamal just got crushed. Letitia mm -hmm. been getting crushed all the time. Y'all didn't mm -hmm. say nothing. Now all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm supposed to be so mad. I'm supposed to be so mm -hmm. full of rage. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's a sad thing that it's a human being and he died, but oh, I see, I'm not meeting your expectation. At that point, right. black rage is proper. Right, right. We provide the object of your rage. Right. But when it's our mamas and daddies and precious mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. and we full of rage, all of a sudden it's criminalized and marginalized and debased. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, mm -hmm. we see the double standards here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tracy, we can go on and on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip to the next question. <laughs> We've got a question from David. Uh, where do various racial hatreds arise from, psychologically or socially? Are hatreds precognitive? How can anti-racist rage combat these hatreds? And finally, Plato suggested that anger can be the moral engine of righteousness. Is that right? There are a few questions in there, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't really, to stay in my research focus, um, I haven't really focused on, on hatred um, to answer with confidence, uh, to try to give an origin story. Um, or at least a psychological or philosophical origin story about, about, about hatred. Um, but I would say, um, you know, one of the things I, I kind of alluded in the first chapter of the book is that there is a kind of anger that those who are full of hate can have. 
Um, and we, we saw it on January 6th. <laughs> we saw it on uh, the March in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I have researched is that when you have that kind of hatred um, mixed with that kind of anger, then you're gonna get the kind of results that we, we saw in those particular instances. Um, and given that it has those kind of features, particularly that feature being hatred, that is something that is a one thing we would know that's the kind of anger that I think we should uh, eliminate. Um, but how to eliminate or at least make sense of that, that hatred, um, that hasn't been kind of my, my vocation um, to do just that. I think, I think my focus has been, you know, how do we properly respond to that hatred? Um, is it possible to love the hatred out of that particular person? Um, um, when that person that is full of hate is not willing to change, then what do we do? What is the, um, do we respond with continual anger? Do we respond to with, with continual forgiveness? So that has been kind of, kind of my, my emphasis. Perhaps Brother West will have an origin story that will be much richer than mine. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> That's a wonderful question. On the origin stories, as you know, from the very beginning, it's going to be complicated, have a lot of different levels to it, because there's certain economic interests that's operating, there's certain social and psychic interests, uh, there's, there's inter that there's, it's connected to people's feelings about their own bodies and their own desires and so forth and so on. So you got this, the psychological and the psychosexual and the psycho political all tied together. But it, it, another level of thing, just very briefly, is the, um, is, it, it's the ways in which hatred itself, like anger though, when it has the right object, it can be justified and proper. I mean, that's what I learned right. in Vacation Bible School at Shiloh, that uh, you know, Christian hatred is a hatred of sin. It's a mm -hmm. hatred of injustice. Mm -hmm. It's a hatred of oppression. Mm -hmm. It's a hatred of exploitation. And if you don't do something, the rocks are gonna cry out. But you still try to love the sinner. You try to stand in contact with the humanity of those who are doing the oppressing because they can change, they can be transformed, but you still gotta organize against them right. because they're, they're dangerous, you know, when the devil's busy in terms of the devil's work, as it were. And so you see, even hatred, I have a certain openness to, because I just, hate injustice. Mm -hmm, I'm not mm -hmm. obsessed with that hatred because I got other joys and loves, mm -hmm. but there's gotta be a loathing that's chronic in your soul when mm -hmm. vulnerable people are being crushed, no matter where they are, in India and Ethiopia and Myanmar and to be, you know, Sikhs in China, it can be what's happening in Iran. I mean, when precious human beings are being crushed, you hate that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the proper hate. Would, would you agree with right. that? I agree, I agree. I mean, it's making me think about a paper that was written by McAllister Bell a while ago, a philosopher, mm -hmm. um, McAllister Bell. And one of the things that she, she argues, she says, listen, there's been a lot of people, a lot of philosophers, feminist philosophers in particular, who've argued for the value of anger. And she says, you know, they, they say that it has these kind of epistemic, um, these epistemic values. And, and, and Angela talks about how it's loaded with information. She talks about how um, a feminist philosophers said that anger can lead to productive action and she says, well, what if you disagree with all of that? How can we still hold anger up as something that is morally valuable? And one of the things she says, and this connects to the point that Brother West just made, um, is that not only does it have this extrinsic value that, we, that I've just talked about, but it also has this intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value is such that it expresses a love for virtue and a hatred for vice. Mm. And so that, that hatred component is still there. And that yeah. love component is also there. We see all those things, anger, love, and hatred working together in a virtuous way. Absolutely. Another question, this one from Iqbal. We hope that rage is not a destination, but a state from which to eventually land elsewhere. In your mind, how does that final destination look? Mm. How would rage get us there? Mm, 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 I like that. I like that. We um, got a high quality crowd out there, don't we? <laughs> oh, they very so creative. <laughs> um, wow, that's a that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, in the last chapter of the book, it's 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 as opposed to calling it conclusion, I call it the end of rage question mark. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of trouble uh, the question of you know when will it end. Um, and I don't know when it will win. I don't, I, I don't know uh, 
when we would get to that destination um, that the questionnaire is concerned about. Um, I'm not even sure that I fully know what it looks like. I just know it doesn't look like this. Um, but I, I, I know that if injustice can be persistent, if racism still exists, um, then the anger still got to be there in order to eradicate it. Um, and so the answer that I give to the, you know, when will, when will rage in is when, when oppression will end. Um, and so I'm more concerned, not necessarily about when will the rage end, but how can we eliminate racism so that this anger has no target? Um, that's, that's what I'm, I'm concerned about. As far as what it looks like, I don't know. I, I try to resist utopian conceptions. Um, um, I just know it doesn't look like this. I know that we can do better. Um, if we can imagine all the things that we can imagine from a technological perspective, if, if the ways uh, that there's been so much change in biotech, there's been so much change in, in the world in the last 40 years, I know that we can do something in, in, the, in, and in the way that we treat each other, in the way that we value each other. I, I, I know there can be a difference, there can be a radical transformation. I don't know what that is. Um, but I know it just doesn't look like this. Um, but I think rage can get us there. And I think one of the things that I articulate in the book um, is that if we live in a world of white supremacy and we wanna live in a world in which all lives are valued, then what anger declares, when you have anger over people who are not valued in a particular society, you are expressing the value of that particular person's life. That's getting us there. That's exactly where we wanna be, right? Um, if we're trying to challenge a racist structure, that is what exists today. And we're trying to figure out how that can be no more then if rage is productive, it can motivate us to engage in political action can, and motivate us uh, to run for political office, um, then it can allow us to challenge those particular structures so that that structure is, 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 is no more. Um, but that's how I think it's, it's, it's useful. That's how I think that it can get us to another world. Although I'm not too sure right now what that world actually looks like. I just want it to be different than, and I know that it can be different than what we have going on right now. Do we have time for maybe two more? Oh, absolutely. I have to go as long as my dear sister, <laughs> Professor Harris. Is I'm here with you. I'm here with you. <laughs> we go with the spirit. We go with the spirit now. OK. Um, all right. This question from Holman. Could you tease out the difference between anger and rage? Ah. The work that was done in the moral psychology of anger to this new book. Right, right. So. I named it the case for rage for a reason. I could have easily named it the case for anger, um, but I wanted to be provocative, not just for provocative sake. I wanted to make us feel uncomfortable about this word because I think people are, are uncomfortable with the word rage, mm -hmm. but not because it's rage. I think people are uncomfortable with anger, no matter what you call it. You can call it indignation. You can call it righteous indignation. You can call it, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but I think we are uncomfortable with it. Um, and that's why I think we need to make a case for it. So I was strategic about calling it the worst thing <laughs> that we can call anger, which is rage, or what we think the worst kind of anger is, and therefore making a case for it. So I, 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 I chose that for a reason. But also I chose um, rage following the tradition of African American intellectual tradition. Um, Cornell, I, I use <laughs> your use of black rage, the hooks use of black rage, or oh, yeah. rage yeah. in the sense of we have this rage. Um, the rage matches the injustice, that the emotion matches the injustice. So if the injustice is extreme, if uh, the lives that have been harmed um, have been harmed in a very uh, atrocious way, then the emotion is gonna fit that. It's not gonna be some subtle, uh, I feel frustrated. I feel frustrated that black lives don't matter. No, no if, if we honestly believe that black lives matter and it's being mistreated and that is extreme, then there's an emotion that kind of matches that. Um, so that's another reason why I decided to, to call it rage because the, the emotion that one is feeling is not just a subtle feeling that comes and go and just, uh, no, it's intense because what we're facing is, is intense. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to get caught up with this semantics. I think even if I say um, that anger is okay, rage is not, I mean, I just think that gets us into to problems um, that just skirts over the issue that we just have a problem with this emotion. I want to talk about it. Let us talk about it. And I want to offer up a kind of virtuous, a virtuous kind. You know, because one other um, 
dimension of this though is the role of courage and the overcoming of fear. Mm -hmm. you know, when Baldwin says to his nephew in the beginning of Fire Next Time, probably most, one of the most important sentences he ever wrote, you comma, don't be afraid. Yeah. You comma, don't be afraid. Like Mary Ellen Pleasant, you know, the black woman who's the godfather of human rights in California. Mary Dwight, Robert Barron, he dropped dead. She's a multimillionaire. She gives John Brown $750,000 in 1850 and creates all these centers for our, the alcohol, dealing with alcohol and the homeless. And she used to start every speech. I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. So the question becomes, how do we provide ways of motivating people to engage in struggles against white supremacy or male supremacy or predatory capitalism, imperialism or whatever? And rage and anger is one crucial feature and aspect, but it's got to be connected mm -hmm. to virtue and form courage so that people actually then intervene because if, they, they, if they're full of rage, but they don't intervene, they're going to burn from the inside. They're going right. to, their, their souls will be devoured because everywhere you look, people catch in hell. Right. Indigenous peoples and immigrants and women, mm -hmm. everywhere you look, and all that rage can do you in, you got to have some courageous intervention to channel that 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 rage mm -hmm. and therefore the, the, you know your text is really a, about struggle i mean it's about mm -hmm. how do we philosophically understand and justify and actually facilitate struggle based on some morality and spirituality mm -hmm. is that, that courage is that make is sense no it makes sense it makes mm -hmm. sense that courage that courage is important i mean you know one of the things that i'm thinking about is certain kinds of stereotypes that is offered up, particularly when it comes to black rage. So mm -hmm. the stereotype of the angry black woman, right? So there's been these kind of stereotypes um, of, of angry black women. What those stereotypes do, at least what I argue, is that the whole purpose of a stereotype is to police the emotions of black women, um, to dismiss the emotions of black women, but also to curtail uh, what they do with that particular anger, right? And it takes, you know, a lot of questions that I get when I get, you know, give talks is that people say, well, you're telling me that I should, you know, um, buy you the anger that I have, express the anger that I have. But what if I confirm that stereotype, right, in the presence of white folk, right? And so, so I'm thinking about the place of courage in those moments, that mm -hmm. you're angry at injustice, right? But you know that if you were to express it, <laughs> Um, even so that you won't keep it bottled up like you suggest, Brother West, there's been these stereotypes, these structures that have been implicitly planted in our minds that we feel that if we are courageous with our rage, um, in order to combat anti-racist struggle, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna, we're gonna at least give in to these kind of assumptions that, that white people have of black folk. And we so, so in some ways we could be undermining the cause. Um, so what is the place of courage in those in those particular those particular moments? And one of the things that I that I, I argue and that I believe is to recognize those kind of subtle moments, the role of stereotypes, um, the role of the ways that society has uh, created these virtues and these vices and connections to our emotions and engage and be courageous to engage in an act of resistance. Um, with our feelings. And I believe that that can happen even if you don't join a protest movement. Um, but it takes courage to do just that, right? So what happens when you're on the job and Absolutely. you know you want to speak up and you're angry? There's something, there's a voice inside of you that says, don't say nothing. They're going to think all Black people act like this, right? And, and, and how do you usher in that courage to say that what I'm fighting for is more than, fight, you know, than fighting for a stereotype or to downplay a particular stereotype? And, you know, how do you deal with the courage in that particular moment? It's a constant struggle. Freedom is a constant struggle. Oh, um, yes. Oh, yeah. Constant that's struggle. Angela, that's what Angela Davis, yeah. right? Yeah. Constant struggle. We have a question from Elizabeth, and this might be a, a way to close out. What are your thoughts about having anger versus joy as a guiding way of life in our social justice work? Or perhaps there isn't a binary. So how do we reconcile being led by both anger and the desire for, or the practice of joy? Mm. I'm thinking about, um, I'm trying to remember the political occasion for this. Perhaps somebody in the chat can remind me. Um, 
I want to say that it was during the election, the previous election, but I could be wrong about this, where I saw black people dance in the street, <laughs> and not only <laughs> white, black people, but like their allies dance in the street. And, um, you know, I saw that joy there. It was a wonderful thing to witness. Um, it's always a wonderful thing to witness. <laughs> people happy. Um, but I think, I think you have to wonder what got them there that they could celebrate. Um, that just as, as, as life moves with ebbs and flows, so there's moments in which, and I'm talking about the struggle, there's moments in which you're angry and then you get a victory and then joy comes. Um, or you're angry as you're on the battlefield during the day and you go home and you feel the love of your family members and you're dancing around the house, right? I think there's a place for it. I, I don't think that because, you know, let me just say this, to be angry, um, doesn't suggest that I wake up angry. I feel it intensely all the time when I go to the bathroom. And I mean, I don't, that's not the experience of, 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 of anger. Um, so I think that there's a place for all that good stuff, for all that, what we call positive emotions. Um, and black folks have shown that there is a, there is a place for it. Um, so I think you can be angry and still have joy. Um, listen, I'm, I'm, you know, I may not look like it now because I'm smiling. There's a lot of things that I'm angry about. There's a lot of things that I'm angry right now about. And I'm talking about politically and socially. I'm still angry people are dying from COVID-19. I'm still angry that um, people are being manipulated. I'm still angry that particularly people that look like us are almost overwhelmingly dying. Um, but I'm sitting here in a moment of joy. And I think that if you are angry at racism, um, make space for joy, make space for love. Um, there's space for that. Um, and I think it's important that we we make space and make room for that. Oh, it's just that's pure eloquence, pure eloquence. Because without making that space, you're not gonna be able to fight. Right. And you have to create conditions under which you can fight. I mean, when we go back to the greatest modern tradition of spiritual fortitude and artistic creativity and moral courage, which is a black musical tradition. And when the voice begins. So is the black folk. You remember the epigraph, the second one of chapter one. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Mm -hmm. Right now, look at all the trouble we've seen. Mm -hmm. From Riverside to New York, Harlem, to Asia, to Africa, to Latin America, to Alabama. Just look closely and you see overwhelming suffering, misery, pain, hurt. And yet our, our ancestors said, Glory, hallelujah. Nobody mm -hmm. knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. What's going mm -hmm. on? This is not logical mm -hmm. consistency here. You see, there's a transfiguration of all of that suffering and anger and rage and hurt into a sense of authorizing another world. Mm -hmm. That all of those things don't have the last word. Mm -hmm. You see, so when Mahalia sings or when Prince plays, they're authorizing another world, an alternative lens, an alternative energy, an alternative world that can keep us connected to how we're gonna struggle against this nightmarish world. You see that that's, and that's where we, we learn from our artists and our musicians, especially. And, and, and what's so wonderful about this text is there's a whole lot of philosophical musicality working in it with the insights from that tradition, with all of the, the, the theoretical subtlety that, that we, we expect from Sister Cherry and, 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 and her philosophical sharp mind, but it's still rooted in the best of a tradition of a great people who transforms whatever misery and anger into mm -hmm fortify to fight with love, with courage, but the rage is also a threat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Tracy, can we get to a couple of questions? Uh, just a couple of more, just a couple sure. more? Yes, sure. yes, 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 absolutely. Indeed. Absolutely. Okay. Um, this is kind of a long one, a little bit of a comment trying to get through the <laughs> comment part. The comment part's a little long. So <laughs> the question is at the end. 
Are there proper methods of cleansing, stroke reckoning, operationalizing rage? What role does catharsis play in our rage? Mm -hmm. Now I was thinking about the cleansing thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use that language in the text. Um, I think the kind of anger that I'm referring to uh, is a virtuous kind of anger that doesn't really need cleansed, um, but it needs to be what I call manage. And I wanna be kind of clear what I mean by that. So typically when, think about, when people think about anger management, uh, they imagine the manager whose main job in a company is to uh, fire people, <laughs> right? So eliminate them or to get them to do <laughs> um, what uh, they want them to do. Um, but then there's another kind of manager who recognizes that its employees have certain kinds of gifts and the whole job of, of his job or her job is to bring out those gifts um, to make sure that they're growing and those gifts are manifesting. Um, so as opposed to cleansing, I, I take on management in the second view in which I say that loading rage is a virtuous kind of anger that doesn't need to be cleansed per se, but it's features. We need to engage in techniques, constant techniques to make sure that we bring out the very best of its features. Um, and once again, its features, it has resistance possibilities, it's productive and motivational, um, it's appropriate, it expresses the value of lives. Um, and so there are certain kinds of things that we can do to make sure that it kind of keep those features that I've kind of, that, that I've kind of talked about. Um, but I don't think it's a, it's a rage that needs to be cleansed. Um, nor when I talk about the other emotions that I kind of talked about that's compatible with anger. I don't think that because you have these uh, other emotions and that make the anger more cleaner, right? I think mm. the anger is good all by itself, but when it gets connected to these other emotions, these other attitudes, it's like MMA fighting. You just have different, you know, a kind of a different tool to engage in different kind of activity. Um, but the kind of anger that I'm referring to doesn't necessarily need to be cleansed. It's not to say that there aren't other kinds of anger that needs to be cleansed, that if you engage in a kind of uh, transformation that you can slowly but surely lead to the kind of anger that I'm offering up. And I think that is the case. So one of the examples um, that I talk about is Bell Hook's use of narcissistic rage in her book, Killing Rage. And I kind of use that as an example. And I basically say, well, narcissistic rage, hey, you're, you're, you're angry at racism. Um, you want things to change, but you want things to change for you. And you're only concerned about yourself and not necessarily all victims of oppression. So what would it take for that kind of anger, the transition to the loading and rage that I'm referring to? Well, perhaps your perspective needs to change. You need to recognize that you're part of a bigger community. Um, that um, it's not, you know, justice doesn't happen in, in um, incubation. Um, in order for real justice to flourish, that the next time an injustice hit you, that you can benefit from that, it's gonna take for you to imagine other people getting free and not just you getting free. So that's the kind of, those kinds of anger is the kind of anger that can be cleanse or transition into the loading and rage that I'm talking about. And it may take just a you know, perspective change. It may take um, you realizing that your target of your anger ain't black folk, <laughs> that it should be at the system, ain't immigrants should be at the system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of angers that I think needs to be cleansed and transformed to the kind of anger that I'm, that I'm, that I'm referring to. Absolutely, absolutely. So one from Manuel, how can we channel the rage of social justice movements to deal with the existential crisis of climate change? Many mm. social groups have done what colleges have done, which is to close themselves off into specialized fields. Hmm, it's a tough question. So say it again, Sister Tracy. Sure, how can we channel the rage of social justice movements to deal with the existential crisis of climate change? And then the second part is more of a comment. Many social groups have done what colleges have done, which is to close themselves off into specialized fields. Right, right. So it is the question that there's a lot of social movements that may be concerned, for example, um, social movements that concern about ending ra you know, racism, racial injustice, um, that hasn't focused on climate injustice. So how can you, is a question, and, and maybe the person who asked the question can clarify for us in the comment, is the question is how do you get them to also be concerned about this other issue? Um, so much so that they also have anger about that particular issue and put that into the kind of work that they do. Perhaps the person who asked the question can clarify for us. Or maybe I'm just 
Manuel said yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a saying that says, um, um, and I'm going to mess this all up, but it, it, it goes something like this. It says, if you're not mad, you're not paying attention. And I think for lots of folks, particularly when it comes to climate injustice, because it's climate injustice that's happening. Um, what's happening with what we call climate change is not affecting everybody equally. There are some communities that are suffering, indigenous folks, for example, um, that are suffering worse than people that live in Boston, for example, from climate change. So the question is, well, um, you know, if you're not mad, that means you're not paying attention. How do we bring these issues? How do we, um, I don't want to say learn more about them, but how do we take them more seriously? Um, and it, it, there's no doubt that I think, particularly when it comes to these particular issues, um, that we have a tendency, and this, I'm about to go on a tangent here, a lot of it is we think that it doesn't affect us when it does, and that's just ignorance. So I think a lot of us need to be educated to see how this affects everyone. This is not just a hippie concern, but this really affects people on the ground and disproportionately people of color around the world. And I think once we begin to see that, um, in addition to knowing that we have an obligation to the earth and to the planet and to the future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think once we begin to see that these issues are very much connected to the issues that we're concerned about, that knowledge, right, um, is going to um, eventually inform and inform our anger and therefore help us to engage in the kind of motivation and productive work to end the climate injustice in addition to the other things that we are concerned about in our particular movement. I mean, one thing I would add is the role of greed, especially mm -hmm. corporate greed. See, we can't even begin to talk about how you deal with impending ecological catastrophe until we get the fossil fuel industry and they tie to just making money. It's just profit and the short term commitment to profit. So if we can't come to terms with greed, especially the greed at the top, then we're always gonna be dealing with in such a, a narrow framework. So even for example, keeping track of white supremacy and the hatred of peoples of color and so forth and so on, but that hatred is inseparable from greed too. Right. Mm -hmm. With the enslavement of our precious folk with money-making, economic exploitation, capitalist preoccupation with land and taking the land from indigenous peoples and gaining access to the resources. So we had to be able to have an analysis and a lens through which we view the world where we can really peg what is pushing the ecological mm -hmm. crisis, collapse, the emergency that we have. And it, it, greed doesn't explain everything, but it explains a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really does mm -hmm. explain a lot. And see, greed is something that is, you know, it's, it, 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 it resides with black, white, red, yellow, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sister, so I said, I said, I, I said, I know I said two questions, right? Okay, this, this is there, one final one. Yeah, there's okay, one more in the one chat. Final one. <laughs> <laughs> I was scrolling through. I didn't know that, but just one, one more. One more. Yeah, this is the last one. This is the last one in the chat. So, Holman, if I'm getting this right, Holman, um, there's a quote, and it looks like the quote is from Nussbaum's work. The okay. emotions are reasoning set in matter. And the reference is to Aristotle. Okay. How can we challenge the selective reading of anger that Nussbaum is doing of Aristotle? Ah, <laughs> y'all not getting me in trouble. <laughs> um, y'all not, not getting me in trouble. Um, I mean, you know, one of the things I, I want to, I want to, I want to say here is, um, you know, it, it, it feels, in some way, one might say that a scholar can't help what they're attracted to as far as research is concerned. Um, and there's just something about emotions and attitudes um, that I'm just passionate about and the way that I see it played out and lived out and our, not only our private lives, but also our social political lives is just illuminating. Um, so I'm very, very interested in it. Um, and um, we have the Greek and Roman tradition who's very highly skeptical about certain kinds of emotions. Um, and when I think about contemporary uh, thinkers, uh, Martha Nussman has played an important role in how I, I think about emotions. Um, she's a brilliant, brilliant individual, prolific thinker. Um, I have learned um, a lot from her. I have agreed with her in lots of things. I disagree with her when it, when it comes to anger. Um, 
But philosophers love disagreement as much as we love agreement. Um, there would be no role for my book if I didn't disagree with her. Um, and um, I appreciate the work. Um, and if the, the reading of Martha is that she misread Aristotle, I, I, before I make that claim, I wanna, I wanna go a little deeper, make sure I do my, my homework. Um, but I just wanna, just wanna take a time to just acknowledge the work that she's done because, the, because of the work that she's done in emotions, particularly philosophically, I'm able to do the work um, that I do. And, and I hope that I'm reading her correctly. I hope that you all read me correctly, but you can only read me correctly once you buy the book. So please, um, please, please, please buy the, buy, buy the book. Buy the book and read it closely to see yes. the full care response to Martha Nussbaum. Mm -hmm. We both respect Martha Nussbaum. Mm -hmm. She's a towering, towering figure. Mm -hmm. But remember now, in Plato's Republic, line 607b5, the traditional quarrel between philosophers and poets Poets are preoccupied with logos, with rationality, consistency, coherence. The poets are preoccupied with contradictions, incongruities, the messiness, the funk. And Audre Lorde's a poet. Martha Nussbaum's a philosopher. Now she's been open to literature and Middle mm -hmm. March by George Eliot and so forth, but she still remains a philosopher, very much tied to Aristotelian frameworks. Audre Lorde is a poet par excellence. Mm -hmm. And the poets tend to be much more willing to step into uncharted territory, mm -hmm. passions and emotions and take people with them. Mm -hmm. I like philosophy that goes to school, <laughs> not just poets, but musicians too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the fascinating struggles in this text, which takes us to these issues that have to do with the Western philosophical tradition, is what does it mean for a sophisticated philosopher to take seriously a grand poet like Audre Lorde and bring her insights into this philosophic discourse? over against, overlapping sometimes, but still over against a Martha Nussbaum or some of the others who, who we've invoked. And, and this is just to whet the appetite of you all out there. <laughs> what you're going to get when you read this text as long as, as well as buy it. You don't want to just buy it just to have it. Mm -hmm. You buy this thing to wrestle with it. Mm -hmm. Out of richness inside of this has been wonderful. So generative, the conversation today. Dr. Maisha Cherry, Dr. Cornell West, we cannot thank you enough. And all of you who stayed on and participated. Maisha, there's such beautiful comments in the chat, uh, you know, comments. And we've got all the questions, and there are also comments just glowing about this conversation, about your work. Here is the book, folks. The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist anti -racist Struggle. You can get it at Celador Books right there in Riverside, right here at Riverside, rather, right here in Riverside mm -hmm. in the Canyon Crest Center. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, would you like any last words? Just thank you, thank you, thank you. This was beyond amazing and I just, and I hope you all get it and read it because we're going to have a amazing discussion come January and we'd like y'all to be there so in person in person <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna change the world if you're on the west coast which is the best coast I mean, yeah. <laughs> doing, doing a winter month doing a winter month <laughs> doing a winter month but you're welcome to join us Dr. West you're you're welcome to join us <laughs> oh no no you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles now and the heat and all the other good people indeed indeed now Best Coast, West Coast, ooh. <laughs> she gone to Medellin now. She gone to Medellin now. Now I said during the winter months. <laughs> during the winter, winter months. months. Oh, but we, but, but, but we, we like yeah, to rock it in the summer. snow. We rock it in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 true. True, true, true. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so this much. This was wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Congrats, Maisha. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. By the way, I see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>